All right, I'll go straight to the point. Um, so let me start by making a couple of observations about Indo-Pacific. As um, people who study regions, um, including geographers, political scientists, know, or historians, regions are very artificial constructs. They are very fluid. Uh, the definitions change. Uh, Southeast Asia was uh, not a term before uh, uh, in, in the 19th century, and in fact, not much of a term before the Southeast Asia Command by the British and the Allied powers in the Second World War uh, was created. Uh, this region uh, has uh, uh, no boundary. Um, so we had uh, Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, East Asia, uh, now Indo-Pacific. Uh, and there is a very big difference between Indo-Pacific and the previous constructions of the region. Uh, so originally the name Asia was given not by Asians, it was actually a Roman province, province of the Roman Empire. That's where Asia got its name and included uh, what is today called Middle East or West Asia, going right up to Turkey. Um, Turkey actually participated in the Asia-Africa Conference in Bandung. Um, so India at one point was considered part of Southeast Asia, as with Pakistan and Sri Lanka, or Ceylon those days. So those things already change. But here is the key point. Asia was constructed by nationalists, people like Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, people like uh, Sukarno, and uh, also uh, even Rijal from Philippines. The, the term Asia started with the Romans, but actually it was given a new lease of life by Asian nationalists. Asia Pacific was constructed by economists. Uh, this was mainly economists from across the Pacific, uh, United States, Australia, and Japan in particular. Uh, and uh, at the track two level, they uh, highlighted the de facto market-driven economic integration of Asia. And they call it Asia Pacific. And then we have Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. East Asia was constructed by people who are politicians who are into identity. So Mahathir Muhammad uh, didn't like the term Asia Pacific uh, because it had too many Westerners like Australia or US. So he thought East Asia should be only for Asian East Asians. So, so, so his idea for the East Asian Economic Caucus uh, was basically in a way to differentiate Asia from the Pacific. And uh, so as we know, Asia Pacific was very popular in the 80s and 90s, but after the 97 economic crisis, it went out of uh, favor and East Asia uh, kind of took over. And East Asia was also uh, the, uh, later the East Asia Summit uh, with East Asia Vision Group, East Asia Study Group, uh, with South Korean uh, leadership. And so East Asia was in fashion for a while. Now we have Indo-Pacific. The big difference between Indo-Pacific and hope it's not too controversial a point. It's not really uh, uh, a, an economic concept. It's not an institutional concept. There's no institution of Indo-Pacific comparable to Asia Pacific or East Asia. Uh, there may be one in, uh, someday, but not at the moment. And, uh, but uh, unlike uh, the economists who created Asia Pacific, and the uh, identity politicians who created East Asia, Indo-Pacific is a strategic concept. It is basically created by strategists from a very strategic, military strategic perspective. And uh, another difference is that uh, the current version of Indo-Pacific that is dominant is, uh, um, has very little input from ASEAN. Now, it is true that Indonesia, uh, especially Marty Natlagawa, the foreign, former foreign minister, uh, had his idea of Indo-Pacific. But uh, the version that is currently dominant was uh, is basically by countries like Australia, India, and um, Japan, and uh, United States. None of them are Southeast Asian countries at the moment. So this is a major, major issue. I would say even challenge for ASEAN. Uh, as a, somebody who has studied ASEAN for three decades now, I have never seen a concept that comes out where ASEAN doesn't have kind of a role in developing. And this is why ASEAN has been nervous about it. Uh, so ASEAN came up with uh, the outlook on Indo-Pacific, which is a very good document, by the way, but uh, still uh, there's no guarantee that uh, ASEAN will maintain kind of a central position or identity in Indo-Pacific. 
And this problem is aggravated by the by the Quad. Uh, Quad is uh, not a military alliance. Very unlikely it will be a military alliance um, <clears throat> because of uh, Caucasus, uh, the Caucasus attitude of uh, India and uh, Japan. But even without uh, uh, being a military alliance, even as a political strategic concept, uh, it is uh, not an ASEAN concept. Uh, so, so that's as simple as that. So if you are uh, looking at uh, the future of ASEAN in the context of Indo-Pacific, it's very ironic. ASEAN is geographically at the center of Indo-Pacific, but it could be marginalized by this concept if there is uh, no attempt to develop an institutional architecture which is comparable to the current institutional architecture uh, based on Asia Pacific and, uh, and East Asia. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the irony. Then I, I, I promise to talk about three things uh, and I'll go to them very quickly. Uh, one, this is in the synopsis I sent. One is about US-China relations. Now, we are looking at the region from the perspective of COVID-19, although, you know, who knows how long the pandemic will last. Uh, it might be gone in two years, it might continue for another five years. It is hard, too early to talk about a post-pandemic age. We are in the pandemic age. This is the pandemic age. Uh, so, so, um, so anything we talk about in terms of the future or the or the trends in uh, Southeast Asia has to be in the context of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, so let me make a couple of general observations about this. One is that uh, COVID-19 is not a regional crisis, very much different from the Asian financial crisis of 97 or even the SARS. SARS actually, SARS 2003, I lived in Southeast Asia during that period, uh, was even though it had uh, its spread to Canada and a uh, little bit to the United States, uh, but it was an Asian, East Asian issue. Uh, so it, you know, started in China, uh, and uh, but spread to Southeast Asia. Uh, Taiwan was uh, also affected. So it was a very regional crisis. Never really spread as globally. Nothing comparable to COVID nineteen. Uh, so it is uh, therefore also. Uh, not a, a crisis comparable to the uh, global financial crisis because the global financial crisis of 2008-9 again uh, did not start in Southeast Asia, it started in the United States, but uh, Southeast Asia was insulated uh, partly because Southeast Asian countries had learned their lesson from the 1997 uh, <clears throat> financial crisis. So they were actually better prepared to deal with the 2008-9 uh, global financial crisis. So keep that in mind. So this is SARS, <clears throat> so unlike SARS 2003, unlike Asian financial crisis 1997, this COVID-19 is a global crisis affecting Southeast Asia, uh, outside in, in some ways. And uh, in that sense, it is a little bit beyond any region, any country, it affects everybody. So whatever Southeast Asia does is not going to be enough uh, Southeast Asia is particularly vulnerable because it's exposed to the forces of globalization, tourism, and tra trade and uh, travel. Uh, having keeping that in mind, the other point about COVID nineteen is that it's not creating anything that we did not see happening already. So it's, I call it a trend accelerator rather than creator. Many of the trends that uh, define this region or Southeast Asia in particular uh, with the security economics or great power relations have been aggravated by COVID-19. But though they were already visible, signs of those trends are already visible. And this is where I come to my uh, one of the, my, my examples, US-China relations. Now, you cannot say that COVID-19 had made US-China relations any worse. US-China relations are already in bad shape because of Trump's trade war and the strategic competition. So COVID-19 aggravated it partly because of mutual accusations between US and China of conspiracy theories and the China virus uh, from Trump, Chinese uh, retaliation by saying that the virus was brought to China by, uh, by a US uh, military uh, sports team. Uh, and now, of course, we have a big the issue over 
uh, with the, the COVID um, virus started uh, from a Chinese lab. And a lot of Americans are convinced that uh, it might have actually started. So uh, uh, moving on to that then, it is not something new that we are witnessing. And the Biden administration is not changing China, the, the Trump-China policy. Biden is very different from Trump when it comes to multilateralism, domestic politics, even handling the pandemic, uh, both at home and globally, and has done an excellent job uh, in, um, you know, with the vaccine, uh, vaccinating Americans. But it hasn't really changed its policy with China. There is actually a good possibility that U.S.-China relations will be worsened. Because unlike Trump was very erotic and very personal, uh, can change his policy with a, with a tweet. The Biden administration has a very strategic, coherent vision, and is very well thought out by a team of national security advisors and secretary of state. So if this, uh, and they want to take on China, compete with China at all levels. Uh, and so therefore we could see a significant deterioration of US-China relations under Biden. Moving to china asean relations, again, there's nothing really uh, that we do not know was happening. Um, but uh, here we could see COVID-19 accelerate certain gaps or widen certain gaps. Uh, and the, I will talk about three gaps very quickly. The economic gap, China is emerging from COVID in a much better shape than any other country, including Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so that will increase the economic gap between China and ASEAN. The, other gap is the military gap. Uh, COVID-19, uh, because of the economic uh, contraction in Southeast Asia, as you know, Southeast Asian military spending is very sensitive to economic growth. When the economic growth is high, military spending, defense acquisitions is high. When uh, in like 1997, the economic crisis, there was a significant fall in Southeast Asia's defense spending. But China is not going to change. So the military gap between China and ASEAN will grow because of the pandemic. That's my sort of a, a conjecture. And then there is the trust gap. Uh, the trust gap was already very wide. Uh, if you know about the survey done in Singapore, Southeast Asian Studies Institute, uh, the China is the least trust trusted uh, <clears throat> great power compared to Japan, uh, European Union, and the United States. China's trust level in Southeast Asia to do the right thing in, um, in international affairs is the lowest among those uh, uh, among the four, including China. So, and this uh, COVID has not helped. Now, it all depends on where you are sitting. I know people will think China has done a great job in vaccine diplomacy, mass diplomacy, but I've also seen uh, from my own interviews and also the surveys that have been done, I just mentioned, China's trust uh, deficit has widened in the region. So what that means for the region is probably that there would be, uh, unless China can reverse it, which it can, I mean, it can change course and uh, have a more sophisticated approach. Uh, but uh, it is certainly going to create tensions between China and ASEAN at certain level, at least for some ASEAN countries. And uh, finally, ASEAN centrality. This is something I'm supposed to talk about. I already mentioned how Indo-Pacific might challenge ASEAN centrality. Um, but I should also tell you that uh, ASEAN's performance in handling the COVID is below my expectations. I am sorry to say this, but uh, what I mean by this is that I had actually expected ASEAN to do much better because it did a fantastic job in 2003, SARS crisis. In 2003, of course, the virus was very different, much less contagious, but still there was more significant cooperation, borders were never closed, and uh, in uh, cooperation in, uh, um, uh, among uh, the ASEAN countries were, to me, much more impressive. This time, borders are closed. Uh, and also, unlike, say, for example, Taiwan or South Korea, who actually learned lessons from SARS uh, 2003 and uh, therefore avoided the, in Hong Kong as well, uh, I don't think there was that much in some ways, uh, and it's not really ASEAN's uh, a challenge. Uh, it came from outside and beyond ASEAN's capacity to handle such a massive global pandemic. But I actually expected ASEAN to do much better, uh, to have much better coordination, collaboration, 
uh, both in terms of vaccines, in terms of masks, in terms of uh, health, uh, public health collaboration, didn't happen. And uh, maybe it will happen in the future, but it's something, something that maybe the European Union has done a better job uh, compared to ASEAN in that sense. Uh, so uh, to conclude then, I would, uh, I would like to conclude with one more thing that is challenging ASEAN centrality and credibility, and that's the Myanmar, the coup in Myanmar in February 2021. By the way, it was not unexpected. Uh, I actually had written in 2020, 2020 that a coup in Myanmar is almost inevitable. Uh, so, but a lot of people, ASEAN countries, did not see the warning signs. They were not prepared how to handle this. Uh, and uh, when the signs were really visible that the, the, the Myanmar government and the relationship between NLD and uh, the military is actually falling apart before the election, signs were visible. But uh, after the coup, ASEAN has been tentative, slow, and this moment of a decisive I mean, moment of glory, so to speak, by inviting the general to go to Jakarta, which I thought was a mistake because um, the ASEAN should have sent a delegation to Yangon first before inviting anybody from there to come to ASEAN. But uh, the delay in appointing a spe um, special representative, at least to the outside world, it is not looking very good. Uh, I'm not saying that this is irreversible. ASEAN can pull back and uh, actually do a credible job in Myanmar, but so far it has not been very credible. ASEAN is divided. Uh, you know, there are differences, significant differences among member countries about how to deal with Myanmar, but also uh, having, it has no credible plan on how to handle a crisis, which is really causing a lot of a credibility problem for ASEAN. So to sum up then, this has been a momentous time, momentous year for ASEAN 2020. And uh, I think ASEAN's overall position in the region, in the security or whatever architecture you call it, has diminished uh, for the past year. Hopefully it will reverse itself. Thank you.